Friday May 40 here. So I was uh, chilling, getting ready for bed last night about uh, 8 p.m. And someone sent me a link saying, wow, Dennis Dale is really going hard after you. And I thought, oh, wow, that's that's interesting because I've only ever had very pleasant, cordial uh, conversations with, with Dennis Dale. He's, it's just always uh, friendly, pleasant, easygoing. If anything, he's you know placating, uh, apologetic. Um, what's that called when you kind of make fun of yourself? Just like the most easygoing guy in the world. And then like years later, like all this lava of rage and resentment and anger and disgust and, and vitriol just uh, will we'll pour out of him. I remember a couple of years ago, I, I posted something negative about Black Lives Matter on Twitter, and Dennis Dale responded, you know, to the to the effect of, you know, Jews don't have to worry about Black Lives Matter. I thought, like, what kind of world does he live in? Once people go down a conspiracy rabbit hole, like, you know, Kevin McDonald's cultural critique, it's very rare that they come back out of it. Like, why on earth would he think that the negative repercussions of Black Lives Matter terrorism would not affect Jews. I mean, it was it's the equivalent of of believing that on 9-11, Jews were given, you know, special warnings not to go to the World Trade Center that day. I mean, it's that same level of conspiracy thinking. I, I'm thinking about one Jewish friend who during the Black Lives Matter riots, like some some black woman just tried to run him down in a car. I'm thinking about other Jewish friends who had their businesses ransacked. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Jews in America have been negatively f- affected by the massive increase in murder, in violent crime, in pedestrian deaths, in uh, driving deaths, in the increased level of, of mayhem in society. Like, what kind of mind would think that Jews would somehow just be exempt from the wave of terror and murder and horrible behavior, antisocial behavior, as police are encouraged to step back from policing? And bad guys take more and more, you know, dominant role in our society. Like, what kind of thinking, how on earth could you arrive at the idea that somehow as America goes down the tubes and America suffers thousands of additional murders and tens of thousands of additional acts of, you know, violent crime and just, you know, thousands of additional driving deaths and and pedestrian deaths. Like, what kind of thinking would, would... would possibly imagine that somehow Jews are just going to be immune from the furies of, of Black Lives Matter terrorism. It's like, what the heck? But, I mean, the, the vitriol just kept coming, and so I just I just muted Dennis on, on Twitter for, for a year or so, and then he, he seemed to get over that rage, and we had this really pleasant conversation about uh, three weeks ago. It was, it was Friday evening. All right, I was getting ready to shut down for the Sabbath, I'd made myself this delicious blueberry smoothie. Like I was just chilling, get ready to, you know, turn all my electronics off, just uh, chill, get move, get into the Sabbath. And uh, I was listening to Dennis Dale's stream, and he he's kind of struggling a bit with the stream, so he sends me an invite, and it's like, yeah, I want to say say hello to you know my my old friend Dennis, and we get on, and we have the the most pleasant, convivial conversation. But then I tune in last night. He's furious. He's incandescent with rage that I ended it after 50 minutes. He says that I lack social graces, which is, which is true. I, I do lack a lot of social graces. But I have a lot of commitments that are bigger than live streaming, whether it's live streaming on my channel, live streaming on someone else's channel. The, the Sabbath for me is a hard out, all right? I, I'm going to get off a live stream as the Sabbath approaches. The, the Sabbath was, was a approaching in just a few minutes i believe it might have been less than five minutes it's like oh i'm sorry dennis i've got to go and i just ended it there because i have commitments i have obligations right i have things in my life that transcend you know my own personal feelings and proclivity so one of them is the sabbath uh, you know another one's my, my general commitment to uh, orthodox judaism another's my commitment to the spiritual principles and practices and and steps and uh, philosophies and uh, communities of the of various 12-step programs, including sponsees, just people I go to meetings with, people I know from from meetings. I have a commitment there that transcends uh, live streaming, right? It's more important to me to do my 12-step work than to, you know, come on and, and do a live stream and, you know, be another ill-informed, 
unsuccessful podcast, bro. I mean, I I enjoy the heck out of this, right? Uh, Henry Claymore had a great comment on, I think, on my other YouTube channel. He said, I, I can't take you in more than small doses because you've got this permanent smirk on your face, right? You've just got this smug look on your face. And it's right. I'm just... Now, I, I'm really happy with the direction of this stream. I'm really happy with the direction of my life. I'm really happy, you know, with the amount of love that I've got going on in my life. I, you know, kept being a pretty happy guy, particularly over the last uh, seven years. And I feel like in the discussions that we're having on this channel, you know, we're getting nearer and nearer to reality. Or if you've got a, a spiritual transcendent uh, ethic, you know, we're getting nearer and nearer to God, God, reality, you know, be, be the same thing to me. And so I think we've developed some, you know, pretty effective principles for navigating life. So recognizing that uh, we're not that important. All right. If, if I die tonight, uh, a few dozen people will be sad and a few hundred people will miss me to some mild degree. But w within six months, then no more than a few people will have a serious void in, in their life if I, I disappear. Like I, I do a show and 10, 20, 30 people watch it live and a few hundred, maybe a thousand or 2000 people, you know, watch it w within a week. And that's it. It's a really small audience. And it just amuses the heck out of me when I check out other live streams like JF Garapi or Tucker Carlson or uh, uh, Dennis Prager or Ben Shapiro or, you know, Fox News or syndicated right wing talkers, like how shallow and silly it is. And so a major theme of my show over the past few months is how stupid a lot of right-wing discourse is. And so, yeah, I'm pretty much permanently amused at the same time with a very keen awareness that at any time, you know, everything may just disappear for me, right? I, I got a, a fainting spell a week or so ago where everything was going swimmingly. I was just like running down the street and then suddenly, like, I, I just felt like I was about to faint. And, you know, I thought my, my life was over. I mean, we all just incredibly vulnerable. And no matter how confident, how smug, how much we smirk, you know, we're all incredibly vulnerable. You know, any moment we'll start feeling small in a big world. We might be absolutely helpless. And so like out of the blue, like after this really pleasant conversation I, I had with, with Dennis Dale, like he just goes on this tirade. I mean, this really personal attack uh, it was primarily personal. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, you know, major, major league uh, disagreements. Uh, what was his? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it was just kind of amusing. So he took apparently he took great offense. Why? Wait, I'm featured in the Why Is the Right So Stupid broadcast. What are you trying to say, Luke? Well, I was just on the show with you, and I said to you, Dennis, that a major focus of my show is how moronic right-wing discourse has become. But Dennis personalizes everything, and you never know it until months or years later when it just you know, pours out in like a, a volcanic eruption of rage. And then he's talking on the stream last night saying, and you know, I trust you're hearing this, Luke, and I'm talking to you, and I stand behind these words, right? This is, you know, this is me just giving you some hard truths, right? And, and then he deletes the stream, all right? So if you're going to go on a tirade against someone, like, you know, just pile on the personal attacks, all right? If you stand behind it, then stand behind it and, and don't delete it. If you don't stand behind it, if you regret it, if you want to reframe it or rephrase it or take back what you said, then you should also go public saying, hey, I made a mistake, right? I disagree with Luke about X, Y, Z, but I'm now embarrassed that I said, you know, G, F, Y. But no, he just like goes on this this tirade of personal attack, you know, just incandescent rage. And then a couple hours later, you know, apparently uh, deletes the stream. And what's really amusing is that most of my regulars are in the stream saying, yes, Dennis, you're the king. Go, Dennis. You're so right. Luke's absolutely insufferable. You know, smug, pompous prick. Uh, you're, you're really nailing him. And Dennis was giving a great stream. Like, it was compelling. It was funny. Uh, some of his, you know, criticisms of me, you know, were pretty damn accurate. It's like, oh yeah, he's got a good point there. You know, I'm listening. It's like, oh, you know, there's another good point. And it's like, oh, can't argue with him there. Like he made a lot of, you know, really sharp, accurate observations about, you know, all sorts of blind spots that I have. And it's like, and he, and then he went on to other topics. Like he's thinking about doing a geographic 
Uh, he's unhappy with his life in Portland, and he feels like he'll be, you know, happier perhaps if he moves to California. You know, do a dra- geographic, maybe, you know, what's holding me back in Portland won't follow me to Southern California. He's reminiscing about, I think, uh, in the Marines, like just a wonderful show. He's got this great radio voice. He's got, uh, you know, a very compelling presentation, like just incredibly likable man. Like I, I've only had positive pretty much interactions with, with, with Dennis. He's like, you know, very uh, easygoing, uh, unpretentious, you know, soul of the earth, like good neighbor, good friend type of bloke. Uh, you know, I reached out to him this morning, said, hey, you know, you want to talk about it? You know, why'd you delete the stream? Uh, like, here's my phone number if you want to talk about it or if you want to come on my stream or I'll come on your stream if you want to talk this through. But uh, I don't think he has any interest. Like what he was saying last night was like, F off, Luke. And another really uh, amusing thing about the stream. So, it, and following on a comments he made years ago about uh, how, how Jews are not going to be negatively affected for some reason. They've got, you know, the, the magic decoder ring that enables them to just bypass all the, the negative repercussions of Black Lives Matter uh, really bugs him that Jews are in right-wing politics. So I'm not sure exactly which intellectual spheres he, he strongly wants to be Judenrein, right? He, he wants the alt-right, dissident right, right-wing politics to be absolutely free of Jews, like F the Jews, stay out of our space, like is really important to him. And so I'd just love to hear, like, which other areas of intellectual discourse would he like to be completely free of Jews? And it reminds me of someone else I used to stream with. He wants all discussion of the Bible and of Christianity, like, completely Judenrein, just completely free of Jews. He doesn't want Jews engaging with Christianity, talking about the New Testament. He doesn't want Jewish scholarship on, on uh, Christianity. It just, you know, just bugs the heck out of him. Like, you know, why don't you guys keep in your own sandbox? Like, at the same time, you know, it would bug them if Jews don't join the right or don't engage in uh, intellectual discussion of the, the Bible or the, the claims of Christianity. So it's, it's kind of that fascinating journey along the, the conspiracy rabbit hole where no matter what Jews do, right, they're just, they're anathema, right? They're horrible, they're evil. Like if Jews engage, they're evil. Why can't they just leave us alone? If Jews keep to themselves and leave you alone, then why do Jews have to be so standoffish? I, no, but you can, you, you, it's, it's amusing when people reach a level of hatred of Jews so that no matter Jewish behavior is completely irrelevant to them. Jews are damned if they support right-wing politics. Jews are damned if they are indifferent to right-wing politics. Jews are damned if they engage. Jews are damned if they don't engage. No matter what Jews do, they're awful. So... I mean, it's pretty clear from Dennis Dale's approach that he wants the Americas completely free of Jews. He wants Europe completely free of Jews. And I assume he wants the entire planet Earth completely free of Jews. And it's, I mean, that's really deep into the conspiracy rabbit hole to think that uh, his problems and the problems of his people are primarily caused by Jews and that if a Jew comes along and tells, you know, a member of his people to go suck off his dog, like his people are just absolutely helpless. Oh, my God, like a high IQ Ashkenazi Jew told me to go suck off a dog. You know, I'm the helpless victim here. So, you know, where Jews are like 0.1% of the population, like in Sweden, or I don't know, 0.23% of the population, like Germany, they're still running things because apparently the, the 99.8% of the population that's not Jewish is just absolutely helpless you know, in the face of, a, you know, a few intense high IQ Jews. And he, he's so down the conspiracy rabbit hole that he thinks that uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the anti-vax conspiracy theorist, is some, like, major truth teller. And how does he know that, uh, like, he's praising Robert F. Kennedy's book. How does he know that uh, Robert F. Kennedy is a major truth teller? Because apparently uh, someone that uh, Robert F. Kennedy criticized on the Joe Rogan show, doesn't want to go on the Joe Rogan show and debate, you know, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. The, the idea is that uh, appearing on a live stream debate, like appearing on a moronic show like uh, Joe Rogan, that that is the measure of uh, truth, right? That's the measure of intellectual honesty. If you can't go on Joe Rogan and debate, you know, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., right, you may have a lifetime 
of uh, amazing achievement in virology. But if you're not willing to go on a low IQ moronic show like Joe Rogan, then you're absolutely nothing. Oh, the other thing that uh, I found interesting that uh, Dennis is upset that I think that people who don't know anything about a topic, that their opinions and perspectives and views and analysis is not worth as much as those who know something about a topic. So Dennis is telling, you can, anyone can be an expert. You can go out and be an expert, right? <laughs> like, you can just go out there and be an expert, guys, right? You don't have to, you know, learn all the different languages of the Bible and all the other languages of Mesopotamia at the time that the Bible was composed. You can just go out there and lead with your heart, and you too can be a Bible scholar. And I, I mean, I guess I'm kind of elitist here. I'm not particularly interested or filled with respect or, or, you know, I don't have a veneration for your views on the Bible. If you can't read the languages of the Bible and you're not conversant in all the other languages of that time, you just don't know anything. Now, I may talk to you like if you're a convivial personality like Dennis Dale or, you know, my old co-host Casey, like if you're well read, we can use the, the Bible as a springboard to have interesting conversation but if you don't know anything about a topic, like why on earth would I accord respect to your point of view? Now, you can be right. I absolutely believe that non-experts can be right and experts can be wrong. But that's not how, I'd, how I would bet, right? The race doesn't always go to the swift, right? And the battle doesn't always go to the strong. But that's the way I'd bet, all right? Generally speaking, you know, the fastest, mo most fit, most skilled football team, basketball team is going to win games, right? Usually the most formidably trained, most, most powerful military with the best weaponry, right, is going to win over weaker military forces. And so I don't believe that you can just go out and be an expert on anything you set your heart to, right? You can become a little more informed, but you know, don't talk to me about your brilliant insights into Aristotle, Right? If you can't read Greek, you can't read the original Greek and the other languages that were dominant at that time, and you haven't you know, studied the, the corpus of Aristotle's writings, it can be fun to talk to you. Like, I, I don't know Greek, right? I'm not an expert in anything, right? But it, I think it's important to develop a good epistemic network so you're not like wowed by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Joe Rogan and other you know, moronic perspectives. I mean, Tucker Carlson... How moronic has his show steadily become? It's become more and more outlandish and, and, and moronic over the past year. Now, it's still incredibly entertaining, right? Now, Tucker Carlson, as, as one philosopher put it, is a hilarious demagogue, right? And I respect and appreciate his skills at, at comedy and demagoguery. Like, yeah, like I give him props for that. He's a really poor source for, for, for truth generally speaking. And we can't all become experts, all right? It takes many, many years of study to become an expert, and usually you have to study under other people. Now, it's possible on your own to get more learning than a PhD in a field. It is possible, but it's exceedingly rare. So instead, we have to rely on other people who do know something. You have to develop a good epistemic network. Now, I've been blessed all right, in that I've never been offered fame and fortune to turn out the moronic trash that characterizes right-wing talk radio and, and Fox News, right? If I was, you know, I'd probably sell out, right? If, if you watch this show for, you know, more than an hour, you know that, you know, I'm not the strongest moral character. But it, it is amusing to see people like uh, Ben Shapiro and uh, Dennis Prager and uh, Tucker Carlson, you know, kind of get on a high horse about morality and truth when the net effect of what they do is to damage people, damage America, and, and spread epistemic pollution, like epistemic corruption. They, they make discerning reality more difficult. On the other hand, on the left, I really enjoy the podcast and the analysis by the two lefty academics behind Decoding the Gurus, Matt Brown and Chris Cavanaugh. But they make it very clear that there's something far more important to them than truth, and that is having a pleasant life and a pleasant uh, professional ascent. So they are never going to say anything 
that is going to cause them harm in their career or cause them aggravation in their life. So the most obvious, basic, replicable, explanatory truths, such as group differences in IQ, right? they're never going to wrestle with that. Right? They're never going to wrestle with all sorts of completely obvious truths because it's more important to them to have a happy life and a happy career. And so, yeah, generally speaking, I think you should uh, follow experts. Generally speaking, unless incentives are so aligned that what the experts are producing is in all likelihood not in your best interest and is in all likelihood not aligned with what is truth. And so just noting the most obvious fact that different people have different gifts, right? That will get you removed from polite society. So when experts weigh in on this topic, they jump through all sorts of convoluted hoops to try to you know, justify their lies because in the final analysis, what's you know, most important to them is their own you know, peace and happiness and professional success. You know, far more important to them than telling the truth. For other experts, they are strongly incentivized to you know, hype some you know, onrushing danger because that gives them power and prestige. Like One of the best ways of analyzing experts or analyzing pundits is does this make the pundit or does this make the expert more important? Does it give him higher status if we accord him respect in this area, if people follow what he has to say? And if what the pundit is saying is in alignment with his own self-interest, right? And if what the experts are saying is in alignment with their own self-interest and higher social status and more power and more earning, then uh, you'd be wise to be highly, highly skeptical. But anyway, this is from the show three weeks ago that uh, I had no idea. He was just furious because I had other obligations and I left after 50 minutes. Like, I mean, where's it written that you have to stay for hours when you enter a live stream? Like I had no intention of coming on. He sent me an invite. I thought, oh, okay, I'll, I'll jump on. But I've also got a delicious blueberry smoothie that I really need to enjoy. You, you seem to have a psychology that your first impulse is we're doomed. And then you'll try to talk yourself out of it and go, well, maybe there is some hope. But no matter what's happening, like if it's if it's bad, it seems like that's just my outside perspective. Yeah. You know, tell me I'm completely wrong. But there seems to be an impulse in you that very quickly goes to we're doomed. Right. So Dennis Dale, from just what I see, is he do Dennis Dale, the public persona. I don't know Dennis Dale, the private human being. We've had minimal private interactions. I would say I've spent 10 times as much time with Dennis Dale you know, in a public discussions on YouTube compared to any private interactions. So I'm really only here talking about the public persona. This is my shtick, right? This is my shtick. This is my performance, right? This is not how I speak in daily life. There are elements of how I conduct myself in daily life on the show. But you don't know me because of my YouTube shows. You only know performance, Luke, in, in a certain arena, right? Uh, you know, I'm not your virtual friend if we don't have you know, private interactions. I'm not your, your virtual friend. I'm just a bloke you know, having a go, you know, another unsuccessful podcast bro, uh, offering an opinion. You know, LOL, nothing matters. Slight overstatement, but uh, probably a lot closer to the truth than my own natural predilection, which is to believe that I'm awesome, I'm important, that I have you know, great things to say that will you know, revolutionize your life and that the whole world should be listening to me. All right, that's how I feel inside. And it's ridiculous. That is delusional. It's maladaptive. Right? If, I, if I operated like that, you know, my life would just go to hell. Now, I recognize that uh, my natural inclinations want to destroy me. My mind wants to destroy me, right? Everything that is natural and easy for me uh, it is probably not good for me. My, my mind is a dangerous neighborhood that I should not enter alone. I think much more clearly when I stand here and think aloud with you and get your feedback, and get your pushback and get your criticism. Like I wanted Dennis Dale's criticism. I want him to keep that stream online because if Dennis Dale makes a good point, he made some great points about me last night that I was completely blind to. Like, you know, he emphasized that I lack social graces. It's true. It's so true, so painfully true, but it's true. And I'm better off for acknowledging the truth of his criticisms. And then 
on the off chance that some of his criticisms of me are not accurate, then they don't matter, right? I, I can choose, I can discern, and then I can see my audience over there at Dennis Dale's stream go, yeah, you know, Luke's a prick. <laughs> Luke's a pompous fool. Can't have a normal conversation with Luke. And it's just hilarious because it's just so tempting to get your sense of self from feedback from your audience. It's just so tempting to give an audience what it wants to hear. It's just so tempting to buy into, you know, praise or criticism that you get from the audience and things like this, when you see like much of your audience going over there and go, yeah, you know, Luke sucks. Dennis, you're the king. You're, you're just absolutely bringing him down to earth. It's like a reminder. Oh yeah. I, I need to get my primary sense of self. All right. From, you know, my own internal validation and uh, validating those criticisms that I regard as valid. So I can hear criticisms and critiques and, and, uh, you know, people poking fun of me and I can just appreciate, you know, that which is true and I can let go of that, which is not true. And, and it's funny to think about, you know, how easily it would be to be swayed that, Oh my God, you know, here's a regular on my stream. And, and now he's betraying me and agreeing with Dennis Dale's, you know, paid for critiques of me. Like, yeah, I, I, I've got an ego. You know, I get, I get my feelings hurt. I get my, my panties in, in a bunch. I, I, you know, have, you know, grandiose and narcissistic conceptions of myself. You know, I'm often tempted to, you know, uh, put, you know, more stock in feedback or audience reaction than, uh, than I really should. It's like, ah, that's funny. What do you think? Am I off base? Is there something to it? No, there's something to it. I'm a fatalist somewhat. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, but I don't uh, say, like now, I'm not uh, a believer like in a crash, you know. I, I think that what I don't like is the idea that where we're going is going to keep in this trend and not that things are going to fall apart as much as you're just going to keep going. So a great comment here in the chat. So this is what Dennis Dale guest was streaming with Luke once after a long hiatus. Yeah, uh, people take things really personally, right? Uh, what's going on with my stream and with my blog is that I say what I believe to be true. And if it hurts the feelings of people that I stream with, like tough luck. Like I, I completely disagree with the most frequent contributor to this live stream, Elliot Blatt. We disagree passionately over all sorts of issues. It would never occur to me for, for a second to hold back on what I believe to be true to try to preserve, you know, Elliot Black coming on the show or uh, Colin Liddell coming on the show. Like, I disagree with, with Colin Liddell about many things, and it would never occur to me to, you know, pull back on my, on my punches of, you know, Colin Liddell's critiques because it's just so important to me that, you know, I maintain a, you know, a virtual friendship relationship, uh, uh, you know, with, with, with Colin Liddell. Like, I come on this show to say what I think and what, what I believe to be true, but for most people who do what I do, it's primarily about building relationships and forming alliances and not, not stirring the pot with people who, you know, are important to the show. So this isn't primarily about uh, personalities for me. It's not, you know, primarily about uh, preserving my relationship with, with Dennis Dale or Kevin Michael Grace or Ricardo or Elliot Blatt or anyone else if it comes at the cost of what I believe to be true. I come here and I state what I honestly believe to be true. And if contributors or audience members, like if every, often every single person who's chatting disagrees with what I say. And it, it never occurred to me to like water down. Well, no, it would occur. Like when you're going against everybody in your life, it, it becomes painful. But I'm not going to water down what I have to say to uh, you know, preserve people's feelings, right? The people who are most important to me, I, I would not invite on my stream, right? So uh, the parts of my life that are most sacred to me, that are most important to me, that are, I'm most protective of, you know, I don't talk about on the stream. I don't bring on the stream. This stream is for talking about what I, I believe to be true. And if what I believe to be true you now offends Dennis and it hurts, you know, Dennis Dale's feelings or it hurts someone else's feelings, then I, I just willing to pay that price. I'm not going to, you know, hold back uh, on my, on my criticisms because I want to say network with JF P. right? I, I, I mean, JF P will believe, you know, the most absolute nonsense 
he will opine on all sorts of topics he knows nothing about, just like Ben Shapiro or Dennis Prager. And he's got a mission to feed his audience, you know, slop that his audience desires. Hey, you know, Ben Shapiro, Dennis Prager, you know, Fox News, uh, Jean-Francois Garopi, they are just feeding slop to the pigs in their audience, just serving up the schlock and the slop and the, the junk. And they're just giving people what they want because that's the way to make a living. And like, thank God I don't have to do that. I, I just get to come here, tell you what I believe to be true. And if uh, the audience doesn't like it, and if I can't, you know, network with other live streamers, uh, so be it. I'll pay that price. I'll have a smaller audience, right? I'll, I won't, you know, have as many allies. You know, I won't be able to, you know, network with other, you know, similarly minded live streamers because it's just more important to me to just tell the truth and then let the chips fall where they may. They are, uh, but that's my fatalist side, you know. I'll say, but yeah, I, I, I'm guilty of that, definitely. Now, what's your, what's your genetic heritage? Um, German and Dutch, Catholic on the German side, yeah. Okay, so I, I don't think that's necessarily, I mean, I'm not the world's expert on German and Dutch. I don't think that's necessarily, is that something rooted in your, in your childhood? So, for example... I, I've also been, I've also had that impulse. Like when, when people saw me at, at age five, they, they thought I, I looked and sounded like a Holocaust survivor. Like at age five, what? age six, age seven, like I was that angry and weird and alienated from everyone. And I just remember for vast worlds of my life, my attitude was just basically you know, effort, there's no hope. <laughs> you know, so so for decades, I I had that impulse, um, and I still have it. I don't. So, oh yeah, another major. I think perhaps the major criticism Dennis Dale had of me is that I was shameless. Right? If only I had more shame. If only I was more content. You know, contorted by shame. So let's remember what shame is, opposed to guilt. Shame is you feel bad about who you are. Right? Guilt is you feel bad about specific things that you've done, but. There's nothing good about having shame, right? You should, you should have guilt. You should be aware of the effect that you have on other people. You should be aware of the effect that you have on yourself, on the people who love you, right? I, I try to bring to this stream, stream you know, a, a vivid sense of the people who I love most in the world. And I, I would like to think that I primarily stream out of the emotion of gratitude for the love that I have in my life, gratitude for the opportunity that I have in my life, a, a desire to preserve the relationships most important to me, who are not with other, you know, live streamers. And and I'd like to think, you know, I come from the, that place of, of love and, and gratitude. That that's the that's the place to to speak from, like to, to preserve, you know, those precious connections. I don't see that. I don't it's see that in you. With, with technology. Like sometimes when I struggle with technology, uh, I'm just like, you know, effort, there, there's just no point, no mm. hope. Um, so I, I'm, I, I think I can talk about this. You know, I think I can talk. And uh, chat says, Luke calling Dennis Dale a loser is typical Anglo-Saxon behavior. Well, if you watch this show for more than an hour, right, I will, you know, uh, cop to being, you know, a loser in all sorts of categories. So. There are lots of areas in life where I am a loser and Dennis Dale is a winner. To the best of my knowledge, Dennis Dale has reproduced. In evolutionary terms, I am a loser. At least that's what I'm saying publicly. You know, you don't have a right to all excess past to my life. So for all, for all we know, there are like there's one or two children out there who I'm paying you know financial support to, but I just don't talk about on a stream. But let's say it's true that I haven't reproduced. Then in that sense, I'm a loser. So in some ways, like we are all losers in life like everyone has very deep pain frustration like everyone has incredibly deep pain that they've tried to share with the people most important to them only to be subjected to the utter lack of interest or care or concern by the people most important to them and so you learn to shut up about the things that are most important to you i mean that's a painful part of life we all lose at you know much of life uh, most of us have the experience at times of winning at parts of life, and then most of the time we're just kind of average. 
So there are areas of life where Dennis is a winner and 40 is a loser. There are probably areas in life where 40 is a winner and Dennis is a loser. There are a lot of areas where we're just, you know, pretty much average. And I don't, oh yeah, Dennis talked about how I'm filled with self-loathing. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, that, there's certainly that, that component to me. But if I'm filled with self-loathing, you will feel that, right? It will not just be explicitly in the words I say, but it will be in how I speak. It will be in my unnecessary tension patterns, how I compress and pull down and distort my voice, distort my, my back and my face and my musculature, my, my alignment, my, my mood. Like if, if I'm filled with self-loathing, that will radiate out. So he, he was criticizing me, I think, if I recall correctly, he deleted the stream. After saying, oh, I stand behind this, look for it, you need to, you, know, you need to hear this, I believe what I'm saying. But it's something like, critique me for being filled with self-loathing and being utterly shameless, which is a, a killer, killer combination. So I don't think uh, having you know, contortions of shame is a good thing. Right? Shame is feeling bad about who you are. Feeling guilt is feeling you know, bad about specific things that you've done. So yeah, I, to the best of my ability, I would prefer to have a shame-free life and I would like to be appropriately guilty for harmful things that I do to other people and to myself. Talk about what I observe in you because it, it resonates with me. It's just that, um, you know, in different situations, it's stronger with me than in other situations. So, like, yeah. if I have money in the bank, you know, I'm less susceptible to this because if I have a technology problem, I'll, I'll hire someone, you know, or I'll buy a new technology. But when I don't have money in the bank and then I have technology problems or car problems or roommate problems or community problems or girlfriend problems, you know, that, that hopeless thing just comes out. But, but let, me, let me move it away from like Dennis Dale, the person. Let me, let me move it towards the, the right-wing distant sphere. So a, a major moronic part of internet blood sports is... You know, people competing who's like a better person, you know, who is a superior you know, man or woman, that's moronic, all right? I, I don't know Dennis, the individual. I only know Dennis, the live streaming personality, who is not co-equal with Dennis, the person. Like, I don't know Dennis's deepest pains. I, I know virtually nothing about Dennis Dale, the individual, beyond what he shares as a persona. And so much of internet blood sports and criticism just conflates the online persona with the individual and then tries to set up, you know, one individual, you know, just claiming they're just so much superior to another. So I may be right about, say, one particular area of public policy. I may be more right than Dennis Dale, but that in no way makes me superior to Dennis Dale or to anyone in my audience. Uh, I could be wrong about 15 different areas of uh, public policy. And, uh, well, it doesn't really matter <laughs> that much. And it only matters modestly. Like, this is for, this is for fun. This is for, for joy, for, for love, for, for, for challenge, right? I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not changing the world here. This impulse of we're doomed seems to be probably the, the most resonant psychological impulse of which I'm aware on the, the right wing to right wing dissident sphere. of. Yeah, why does, you know, the popular right-wing you know pundits why are they so in love or why are they so addicted or so compulsive about feeling doomed it's un unnecessary right left and right are simply evolutionary adaptations to you know, work through selection pressure to pass on your genes and in some circumstances a left-wing uh, policy or politics is more adaptive to passing on your genes and in other circumstances a, a right-wing perspective is more conducive to reproductive and evolutionary success. That's it. And it uh, really doesn't matter that much who's president of the United States, maybe you know, up to maybe 5% difference to your average American. But for 99% of Americans, 99% of the time, it doesn't really matter whether Joe Biden or Donald Trump is president. Like, we talk about politics so much. The only reason to be really invested in politics is because you love it. Right? You can't do anything about it. The, the odds that you can have a substantial effect on the political life of the United States of America, a country of 330 million, is, the odds are highly against you. So we talk about politics on this show because it's fun and it's a challenge and it's the equivalent of uh, uh, playing chess.
I mean, if I weren't live streaming or socializing or studying Torah, I'd be making money. And I'm not going to give you the exact figures here, but let's say, you know, my options are in the, in the ballpark of, you know, 50 to to $100 an hour, right? If, if I, instead of spending time preparing for my live streams, just wanted to make money, that's the, the ballpark. It won't, won't be precise. That's within 10% of the, the options that are available for me. So to... To do a typical live stream, which lasts about an hour, and I probably do an hour or so of prep, right? Uh, that usually costs me about hundred dollars, really, in you know what money that I'd otherwise make. And so I typically probably earn about five dollars an hour for the effort that I put into my my blogging and my my videos, and you know I do them for for fun, or may even be closer to zero when I I guess factor in. You no know, internet computer expenses. People who talk on YouTube and podcasts, what do you think? Uh, I don't know. It's a powerful part of it. I mean, I don't know if it's fully the most of it in that it, a big part of it is, it's must be seen as, uh, frankly, as a reaction to losing, uh, a reaction to a you know the continuing just we're just getting battered uh culturally uh and you know i always say it's only natural it's crazy that we think we we what do we expect from especially from young men who feel like they're li being left out entirely uh ang some anger is appropriate but yeah i mean you're right it's uh, there's too much doomerism but of course it might be inaccurate uh, yeah, i think it, too. it might be fully accurate but i think what's going on so my experience of uh, doing as many live streams as I did with Dennis Dale is, to me, it feels like we were in the trenches together, right? T to me, this is mateship. We, we were there in the trenches. People were taking fire at us. We were taking fire at other people. To me, it's, it's a very close bonding experience. And so, yeah, it, it stings when someone you were in the trenches with for years and just comes out and rips you to shreds. But after you get over the sting, you just evaluate, okay, what, what's true? what's valuable about the criticism and what's, what's not accurate. So, you know, I thought I had a very convivial, friendly chat with Dennis Dale and, you know, I found out I was wrong. You know, I don't enjoy finding out I was wrong. Uh, am I just using people to prop myself up? Uh, that was one of the, the focuses of Dennis Dale's critique. You know, so let me think about that. Am I just using people to just prop myself up? No, I, I don't think that's accurate. So I don't have to, feel bad. I mean, a lot of people that you meet in life are similar to this Dennis Dale persona. I don't know Dennis Dale the person, but they will placate to your face. They will be nice to your face. And then weeks, months or behind your back, you know, they'll just, uh, they'll just slash it and stab you. I mean, that's a personality, right? Dennis is not someone who, who likes to confront. I am not someone who likes to confront. So a lot of people will be perfectly nice to your to your face and then just rip you to shreds behind your back. That's just the, the way the, the world is. Uh, you know, people will do, you know, a drive by slash and grab stream and uh, then, then delete it and move on. All right. Just like uh, people I, I stream with on this channel, they had no compunction about offering all sorts of opinions on books they hadn't read. Like to me, that was like the, the deepest form of, of corruption, but uh, their attitude was, Hey, my life is great. Now, don't worry about it. So I think, you know, you should stand by your words if you say them publicly, either stand by them or retract them or provide context for them. But you know, don't do a, a drive-by, you know, slash and grab, you know, personal assault on someone and then just delete it a few hours later and just, you know, completely walk away. Like, you know, stand behind your words or uh, qualify, retract or, you know, amplify on, on what you did. I mean, I, I was on his stream for 50 minutes. Like, if he's so furious, like, why didn't he say anything on, on the stream? On the other hand, I'm consistently oblivious to how often I'm hurting and infuriating other people. So he had some good criticisms there. I, I do lack the, the social graces. It's funny, I developed a, an unhealthy dynamic with Dennis Dale that I also had with a girlfriend. You remember our Taurus streams? I kind of... I needled him a lot. I sometimes wasn't very nice to Dennis because when I would needle him, he would have the reaction of, I'm sorry. And that would lead me to needle him more 
even tiny little yelling at him, which I'm not proud of, like if his mic volume wasn't correct. Uh, you know, on the other hand, there are other personalities like Ricardo, who if I needle and he doesn't like it, he'll go, F you 40 and just like, you know, rip me to shreds. So if you, you know, if you put up with, if you put out disrespect and abuse, and God forbid, I hope I wasn't, but I'm afraid it was disrespectful to Dennis Dale at, at times, and it built an unhealthy dynamic. And he would say, I'm sorry, but then inside he was raging, and the, the, all the anger would just pour out months, years, years later. Uh, and I got into that same dynamic with my you know, ex-girlfriend, Christine. I would needle her, and then I would disrespect her and then I would taunt her and then I ended up yelling at her and it's the only girlfriend I had where I got into that dynamic but there was just something about the combo of the two of us that did not bring out a very nice part of me hmm. I, I was also struck uh, Dennis was disgusted that I did not have the exact identical reactions to life that he does that I'm not constrained by everything that constrains him, that I'm not twisted up by shame in the same way that he is. And uh, look, we're all, we're all different. Different people have, have different gifts. And yeah, absolutely, I can be a hypocrite, you know, because I have all these allegiances to things outside myself. There are so many different ways you can point to my behavior, my speech, say, 40, you're not living up to a, a higher standard, right? I have you know, obligations to... Orthodox Judaism and a very, you know, detailed corpus of law. I have obligations to a concrete community, to concrete 12 step communities, to a very concrete 12 steps, 12 concepts, 12 principles, 12 tools, you know, various, you know, policies and procedures governing all sorts of different 12 step programs of which I'm a part. I'm an Alexander Technique teacher, right? I want to embody the Alexander Technique. One of the great insights I got from the Alexander Technique is that, uh, all beliefs are just unnecessary muscular tension, right? may not be 100% true, but it's like 95% true. You'll notice the more intense you believe something, the more tense your body. The more relaxed your body, the more free you are in muscular tension, uh, the less tightly you hold to any particular belief. So I have all these commitments and allegiances to things outside myself, and so you can critique me you know, 50 different ways to Sunday by holding me up against these things that uh, I pledge my, my loyalty to. So the Alexander Technique, you know, it really doesn't matter how amazing I am as a teacher. There are certain fundamental principles of the Alexander Technique that I want to get across to my students. Uh, with regard to 12 steps, all right, there are certain fundamental principles and tools, right, that I want to get across to my uh, sponsees and to people who call me for uh, feedback or, or advice, all right? It has nothing to do with me. There are these things outside of me that I pledge my allegiance to. We, I think we've developed some fund foundational principles for getting closer and closer to reality in our conversations on this show, such as, you know, we're not that important. Uh, left and right politics are just evolutionary adapt adaptations to changing circumstances. Uh, generally speaking, you know, experts know more about a topic than, than non-experts. Uh, we, we need uh, other people. We reason much more effectively when we reason socially, when we reason together, when we're challenging each other, then we get, go off on, on our own. So these are principles that uh, transcend me, that transcend you. So there are all these things outside of myself that I live my life by imperfectly, striving to live my life by these transcendent principles. And it makes ridiculously easy to point out I'm a hypocrite because obviously I don't live up to all these things. So you know, for someone like Dennis Dale, what, what sacred text is he accountable to? What, uh, what intense community is he accountable to? What, what you know, principles are laid out in you know, what system of living that he's accountable to that you can say, hey, Dennis, you're not living up to X, Y, Z. All right, let's go back. Is it, okay, most people who have the time to do what you and I are doing right now, let's be honest, most people in our position are socially losers, right? Most people have <laughs> the time, yeah. the inclination, and, and the drive, and the desire to spend hours online, you know, critiquing society, 
wheeling, what's going on? Most of us are losers. And, and so I think what's going on here. Yeah, most people who spend much of their time doing what I'm doing now are probably losing at the game of life, and I don't uh, exempt myself from that. Yeah. Is that if I'm right that most of us who are doing what we're doing now are socially losers, that's because we are wired, we become wired to being addicted to losing. And so we see everything, we experience everything through the prism of losing. Right. And it would be incredibly uncomfortable for us to do too much winning. We we couldn't handle it. And that's why like none of us none of us in the right wing distance fear. So remember, this wasn't uh, planned. N no prep went into this. This is uh, Dennis Dale sent me an invite. He asked me to come on his show uh, just a few minutes before the Sabbath. And so I you know, tried to do the best I could, try to create the most interesting show, be the best guest that I could be, make the biggest contribution that I could to Dennis Dale. Just like that's how I try to go through life. Like I usually up at 3 a.m. I'm excited about my life. I want to make contributions to the world through my blogging through my videos, through my interactions with, with people, through my commitments to various communities, through, through learning, uh, through you know, the, these concrete connections that uh, sustain me. So what is winning? So depends, right? We all have a hero system, so it depends on your hero system. So if you want to think in evolutionary terms, winning would be passing on your, your seed to the next generation, getting married, having kids, uh, most people should get their primary sense of meaning from their family. So getting married, having kids, building a family, for most people, that's winning. That should be the primary sense of meaning and purpose and excitement in your life. People like me who don't have children, who are bachelors, we have to go out into the world looking for excitement. We're constantly on the lookout for excitement. So I get, I guess, much of my excitement from doing these live streams. If I was married with kids, all right, I wouldn't be looking for excitement because you get pretty much all the excitement you need just from having a family. Uh, winning at life means not being in you know, desperate straits, all right? You have money in the bank, you are developing your savings, you are developing a sense of agency. So much of your life is not you know, at the, the whims of other people or fate, such as like having a long commute, all right? Most people find a long commute unhappiness producing. So if you're happy, if you're looking forward to tomorrow, if you're looking forward to tomorrow, you're winning at life. If generally speaking, you're dreading tomorrow, you're losing at life. Right? That's really simple definition of happiness, simple definition of winning. Look forward to tomorrow, you're winning at life. If you're dreading tomorrow, you're losing at life. You can stay together very long. I don't know, what are like right wing, you know, YouTubers or podcasters who, who can work together for very long. We all split apart, you know, fairly quickly. And I think it's because there's, we have an addiction to losing. And I'm not, certainly I'm not exempting myself from this. I, this, this applies to me, I'm a 50. So it's a very dangerous thing to interact with people who are addicted to losing. Right? Some people just have a fatalist strain in them. And this is Dennis Dale, a public persona. Right? I, I don't know Dennis Dale, the person, so I'm just critiquing a public persona, a shtick that he, he broadcasts, right? which may be completely different from Dennis Dale, the private individual, but it's very dangerous to interact with people who are addicted to losing because they will resent you. Right? They, will, they are addicted to feeling victimized. And so if I go on his stream for 50 minutes spontaneously, right, he will hate me because I left after 50 minutes, right? There is no way that I cannot continually give Dennis Dale a feeling of betrayed because everyone that Dennis Dale ever gets close to gives him a feeling of victimization and betrayal and, and victimhood as he presents it in his, his public persona. So it's very dangerous to bring like the wounded animal into the light, into the sunshine, because what happens when you reach out to a wounded animal is like hold up in a cave, they will bite you. Right? So you interact with people who are addicted to losing. They will bite you. They will hurt you. They will rage at you. And they may be perfectly nice and pleasant and even come across as you know, grateful to your face. But weeks, months, years later, that will be sure to like, uh, dig in the knife. Right? And uh, my, my estimate is about uh, a third 
of the population is just addicted to losing, addicted to hiding. And to the extent that I, is, is possible for me, I would like to have a, a small, modest role in encouraging people to come out of hiding and to develop their talents and to be a blessing to themselves, uh, to other people and to the world. So that's the, that's the motto of you know, some of the 12-step programs that I, I belong to, you know, bringing souls out of hiding. And I like that motto. It's kind of a motto for this show. I want to develop a list of the foundational beliefs that we've kind of developed on this show for you know, a more effective life. But uh, yeah, 99% of the people who want to come on the show, I don't want them on the show because I know they're going to get back at me for offering them the opportunity to be more, more visible. And people who are wounded and addicted to losing, they will get furious if you suggest to them that there might be a more effective way to live or a happier way to live. I mean, why do people love conspiracy theories like, you know, all their problems are caused by the Jews? Uh, conspiracy theories appeal to losers, people who are losing at life and they want to find some grand big conspiracy that explains why they're not as successful and happy as they would like to be. They want some you know, magic key to explaining why they are losing at life. And so most people in dissident politics are very much like those people who escape from a lunatic asylum and then go out into traffic and start directing the traffic, right? Now they've got a big old plastic armband from the, the loony bin, but they're out there, they feel qualified to direct the traffic, right? That's what most of us, and I think that would apply to me in a lot of my online activities. I am the equivalent of a bloke who's escaped the loony bin and now feels qualified to start directing traffic. I mean, much of what I produce online is just bonkers. Right? And, and you'll never succeed with any movement that is primarily filled with faithless and, and losers, right? People who are quick to take offense, people who cherish their grievances, right? People who aren't on a good life trajectory and want to, you know, offshore that onto others and blame other people, right? Uh, you'll only get pain from interacting with them. Because I don't bring, 99% of people who want to come on the show, I don't bring them on. So when you reach into that dark hole and try to extend a hand to a wounded animal who doesn't want to get healthy, right? They will bite you. And I've often extended a hand into some dark holes to try to help someone into the light, and they bite me. It's the, it's the price of doing business. Other people genuinely want to improve and get healthier. And some people, some of the time, I think some of what I can offer sometimes is mildly helpful. I, I mean, my demographic is you know, largely men who've lost their way, who can resonate with my own tales of, of loss and, and failure and humiliation. And of course, you know, when you live stream, right, you're setting yourself up to be, what's that thing that's filled with candy that the kids take a whack at? Right? You're just setting yourself up to be you know, a person that people who are frustrated will just take whacks at you because it's very uncomfortable to just kind of sit with your own frustration, your own pain, your own anxiety, your own depression. It's just so much easier to displace it under someone else like a live streamer is like oh this this smug smirking 40 bloke with his fake australian accent f him now as you develop a more productive life you start sensing the smell of people who are addicted to losing right the, the smell of fatalism on people and you will generally speaking avoid such people at all costs unless they, they want help and then you help them moderately, but you can't help people who don't want to be helped. So always easier to get mad at other people than to look at your own life and notice how you're getting in your own way. All right, let's play a little bit more from three weeks ago. Seven year old bachelors never reproduce. Right, I think we've got a, an addiction to losing. And so we, we, we interpret everything to meet this need. Like I, I remember the most painful events of my life are when I am rejected, like when I am pushed away from a relationship or a community. And so I have found ways to re-experience rejection over and over and over again. I put myself in those places to experience that again. So, you know, talking on YouTube is a great way 
to. Yeah, I, I'm kind of humbled and humiliated and frightened by this, this pattern in my life of just unconsciously bringing about the rejection that constituted the most intense part of my childhood. So I experienced rejection growing up, you know, again and again and again. You know, my mother was dying of cancer. I was staying in foster care with many different families. I was moving around a lot. I was, you know, I was bounced off the walls. You know, I just had the, the heck, you know, beaten out of me. You know, kids would, you know, attempt to, to drown me when I was, when I was little. And like, a lot of rejection, but it made for the most intense experiences of my childhood. And then I start to become an adult and I feel driven against my own best interest, against all sanity and reason to recreate that rejection over and over again. I'm so impressed by Dennis Prager when he says he's never lost a friend. I mean, I can't say that. I, can't, I mean, I've lost way too many. Create more and more rejection in your life. Because, you know, <laughs> But let's be honest, most people who do what we're doing damage our lives by doing this. Like, usually we, we create far more trouble for ourselves than like, like positive opportunities. And so I got hooked into recreating rejection. I so stalwart of the show, Art Bell, thought it was a real tell on this show that I was drinking so much. Yeah, I had an entire blender of a delicious blueberry smoothie that I was you know, preparing to enjoy on my own until I got the invite from Dennis. And I thought, you know, Dennis has come on my show so often. You know, it's 40, it's time, you know, you go on his show, you know, give back a little bit, see if you can contribute to, to his show. And so I'm enjoying a blueberry smoothie. So what's the, what's the killer tell, Art uh, Bell, that uh, I had prepared this enormous blender of a blueberry smoothie before I ever got the invite to appear on Dennis Dale's show? I, I just felt some necessity to join communities that would reject me and to just recreate the, the dynamic of being excluded and rejected over and over again. Uh, my therapist said if I wrote a, a memoir, I should call it The Uninvited. And so I think most of us who do what we're doing right now, I think we're addicted to losing. It's wired into us. We didn't choose it, so I'm, there's no self-blame here. Like, I'm not blaming anyone who's in this state, and I'm not blaming myself. But I think we're wired to, to lose. And so we interpret everything through a framework of losing, and we need... Damn, 40, this is great content, man. I am bestowing awesome content on Dennis Dale's show. Like, how on earth could he take offense at this? We're having a, a powerful conversation here. That, that, that we always need to lose because it gives us, it gives us, there's a payoff for us. Oh, the payoff is that we get to escape, I guess, responsibility and being, like, reasonable yeah. and responsible. Uh so I'm just coming to you off the top of my head. Any, any thoughts? Yeah, no, yeah. I, I remember, yeah, Dennis had some really good criticisms last night of the stream that he deleted. Dennis, why'd you delete it? Such a good stream. Right? It's just incredibly charming, funny, uh, often you know, very, very accurate. But uh, I, I do like the social graces. I remember this one friend who often invites me for dinner, and I often leave after an hour. Like if I'm bored in a conversation or a social gathering, like, I just leave. I feel like I'm, I'm 57. I'm just not going to waste time in you know, social interactions that aren't working for me. So I also am not particularly into saying goodbye. Right? That's not a high value for me. So a lot of the more charming people I know, it's a very high value for them when they're at a uh, social event to you know, say goodbye to everyone that they talk to. I, I, just, I just leave. I, I know I'm in trouble when I'm dating a woman and she is less you know, socially aware, socially skilled, socially gracious than I am. I mean, that's very rare. Probably only 10%, maybe 5% of, of females are less uh, socially gracious than I am. But on occasion, I've met them. On occasion, I've dated them. But that is a, a huge warning sign if, if someone has you know, fewer social gracious, graces than I do, but I don't want to be held hostage to convention and to boring people, right? I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave. And so I could have gone on Dennis's show and done a boring repeat of things that people on the right have said 10 million times about how the left is horrible. But I mean, that's boring. That's been done to death. I tried to produce the, the best show that 
I possibly could. I, I wanted to contribute as much as I could to his channel, his show, to to the conversation that he had, had fostered. But I mean, some people just are addicted to storing up. They they get fuel from the enormity of the huge resentments that they build against others who've purportedly done them wrong and somehow denied them the success that they're owed. Uh, the last time this kind of happened to me was Andy Nowicki, right? And Dennis Ale and Andy Nowicki, very similar, very conspiratorial, uh, fundamentally decent, nice, friendly, affable, convivial uh, people, like good neighbors, good friends, uh, like... You know, Dennis and Dale and I, Andy Nowicki and I, are not going to go back and forth, you know, bashing each other. Like, I make this one video, Dennis made his one video. I don't know, maybe he'll have a follow-up, maybe I'll have a follow-up. But that'll be it. Like, this will, this will die out in, in, a few, in a few days. Uh, I think I'm pretty clear on my show that, you know, I'm not superior overall to anyone, right? I'm not a superior man. I... Once uh, ran through a red light at about 70 miles an hour, I could very well, you know, kill a whole family with my idiocy. I'm just another podcast bro. I'm another bozo on the YouTube bus, you know, frequently spouting ill-informed opinions. And uh, this, this stream, the stream I'm commenting on, Dennis Dale's stream, it, it shows what a weak instrument reason is. Right. You know, what's really revving Dennis Dale's engine has absolutely nothing to do with me, nothing to do with what I've said to him, nothing to do with what he's saying. I guess everything to do with the particular combination of his genetics and his early imprinting. Right. And so the way I operate, too, primarily comes from my genetics and my imprinting. My, my reason is a very weak read compared to these forces. But I, I noticed with, with Dennis and with Jean-Francois Garopi and most of the people on the dissident right, they have increasingly entered a tunnel and they basically only talk to people who agree with them. And they basically only read things that they agree with. And this kind of narrows their focus and it predisposes them to anger because it makes them less able to understand the world around them. So I don't think there's anything about this show I did with him that precipitated his anger, right? It has nothing to do with me. I thought it was nice to reconnect with Dennis. Nice to have a cordial chat. And if he takes, you know, tremendous insult and basically says, fuck you, I want nothing to do with you, 40, that, that has nothing to do with me, right? Like he's angry, he's angry at me, but I have nothing to do with it. I'm reminding him of some things. I'm tripping some wires in his psyche, in his soul, apparently, but it has nothing to do with me. I mean, this is Dennis. He's perpetually enraged, embittered, and right now it's me, and you know, next hour will be at himself, and then it'll be at, at somebody else. There's somebody on the internet who's wrong. A lot of you know, dissident right uh, personalities are just perpetually angry and furious and, and resentful because the world has screwed them over, has disrespected them. But uh, ultimately it comes down to you willing to respect yourself. Do you live in a way so that you like yourself? Or do you have this perpetual need because you don't like yourself? You have to keep offloading this self-loathing, this rage and resentment at uh, other people who may reach out to you and show you some kindness. So Dennis wanted to know last night, why on earth I'd want to hang out with people on the right or with the alt-right? I've never sought to bring alt-right people into my personal life. The alt-right is a group of people I've written about and commented on, and that's it. Like, why did I want to hang out with porn people or criminals or mafia or any other subculture that I've jumped into? Like, do you think I get any benefit from listening to Dennis Prager? I mean, I don't. I don't get any benefit from reading Dennis Prager. But you have to choose some specialties so that you can bring some value, right? Part of what you're doing when you're a live streamer and a blogger is selling your soul. You are commodifying your soul. You are taking your life and your feelings and your experiences and, you know, offering them up to the public but also you want to develop some level of expertise. You want to have some specialties. So I feel perfectly comfortable talking to Dennis Dale and you know, other people on the alt-right. And if they're not comfortable with me, that has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with their own lack of comfort with themselves and with reality that they you know, feel comfortable projecting onto me. You know, I'm, the, I'm the bad guy here. But you know, my, my Sabbath, my commitments, my 
transcendent obligations are 1,000 times more important to me than appearing you know, on a live stream or on a TV show. And uh, these things aren't personal, right? A lot of people just take things very personally. Like Dennis took great offense at the title of my stream about how you know, right-wing punditry has just become so stupid these days. Like he experienced my views on right-wing punditry as a personal attack. It had nothing to do with him. And I, I think he's developed really poor epistemics, and it pushes poor epistemics when he makes the case that anyone can make themselves into an expert and that anyone with an opinion is you know, approximately as valuable as someone who actually knows what they're talking about. You're not. All right, let's play a little bit more from three weeks ago. Um, well, you mean if you've been losing for a long time, you might get afraid of winning because you don't know how. You, you actually take some solace in losing because I think you said in there um, it, it relieves you responsibility. Maybe there's a romance to it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to, to the losing. Uh, it's a cope in that sense. Um, but... Um, uh, something you said, I forgot that I wanted to talk about. But anyway, um, you, uh, my biggest fear, is listening to you talk about how none, none of us can work together over here, uh, makes me worry that, um, forget the whatever, the, the content of the cultural f thing that's going on. What's happened is winners and lo losers have been sorted. Maybe it's not meritocratic at all. It doesn't matter. And... We've been sorted by a, a sort of uh, a stubborn individualism and an inability to work together, and that's killing us, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at how the, the distant right, you know, streaming podcast here. We can't work together for very long. We always, it always cracks. This is such a high quality conversation. I mean, can you imagine being enraged and angry and furious like w three weeks after this conversation? when you know, I, I came on his channel and I, I played a role in creating a great conversation. This is good stuff here. I mean, good stuff from Dennis. Like I give Dennis credit for, you know, stimulating, I think some good, good ideas in me. And I give myself some credit for stimulating some good ideas in Dennis. What, what a convivial conversation. And then to be so angry about it. It's, it's amazing. So you know, as opposed, well, I don't pay much attention to the left, but I got to think that people on the left, there are a whole lot of them who, who are working together you know, far more effectively. Yeah, I'm probably idealizing. All right. The, the left thinks that the right is so cohesive and the right thinks that the left is so cohesive because I don't really know the left very well. You know, I'm projecting probably all sorts of virtues onto the left here that aren't really there. And so we are recreating you know, rejection and alienation, like even when we're trying to build something because we are just wired to split Maybe. apart. And, and we've got stories for it that, well, you know, I'm a heroic truth teller. I, I'm just not willing to <laughs> make the compromises of these other, you know, losers, you know. And so... There is that. You know, and something going on there, I think. Well, I misunderstood what you said, but I think there is something to... Uh, that we're over here and we are more honest and 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 that's because maybe it's because we're losers and we don't have anything to that that to risk so we go ahead and do these things which you say and i agree are kind of damaging to our lives and at the very least i'm wasting my time here you know um yeah I... here's one thing another thing that i think is going on and i got this when i was interviewing andy nowicki and um, I've, I've taken an increasingly anti-conspiracist uh, mindset. So, um, but anyway, one thing that struck me from talking to Andy Nowicki that I think is, is prevalent in the distant right sphere is that we, we have to cope. One of our favorite copes is, well, at least I didn't fall for the BS man. You know, yeah, those yeah. people are earning six figures. Those people who are happily married with kids. You know, those people who have, you know, a position in polite society, well, you know, they are mouthing the slogans of the, you know, the, uh, the people yeah. who, who dominate our society and are on the left and, and wrecking. Well, at least I see through the BS, man. And I think that's 
like one of those powerful copes for those of us in the distant right, is that we're so assured that we see through the BS, that we're the truth tellers, that we're, you know, the last honest man, so to speak. And, you know, hundreds of years from now, people will build statues to us. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. But this all sounds very good, but I wonder if the others... So I remember... The, the following video, I think, is what really set off Andy Nowicki after I, I interviewed him. Uh, and they can't examine whether or not they really do see through the bullshit. Here. So I've had my share of failure in life. I've had my share of humiliation. I'm a 55-year-old bachelor. You can objectively look at my life and think, oh, this guy's a total loser. Loser. What a dweeb. Shame. He had some talent, but wasted it on narcissistic delusions and attention-seeking. And uh, I think in large part due to my failures, due to my humiliations, I've spent a lot of my life reading conspiracy theories and dissident points of view. And I remember it was a great comfort to me that no matter my levels of humiliation and failure, at least I saw through the bullshit, right? So everyone else around me was more successful and more happy and more accomplished, had more you know, positive things going on in their life. But at least I saw through the bullshit on the Kennedy assassination. At least I saw through the bullshit on voter fraud. And uh, one of my phases of like, really delving in deep into dissident right materials was between 2013 and 2018. And uh, some of that time was not particularly successful. There were years there where I had over $50,000 in credit card debt. And so by any objective measure, I was coming up and passing the age of 50. You know, by any objective measure, I was just failing and failing and humiliating myself and failing and failing. But there was one really solid sense of my self-respect and self-esteem that I had. And what was that based on? It's based on, well, at least I see through the bullshit. So everyone around me, they're, they're more successful. They're happier, they have more good things going for them, but at least I see through the bullshit. So I notice this with a lot of people who get into dissident materials and conspiracy theories. It's inevitably that it's overwhelmingly marginalized people who get attracted to marginalized movements and marginalized theories, right? So it's, in essence, it's overwhelmingly losers who get into conspiracy theories and it's overwhelmingly losers who get into marginalized politics and any you know, marginalized and stigmatized social movement, right? Only losers are going to do that. But even losers need a sense of self. And so for people who are losing at life, conspiracy theories are very attractive because they tell you that you're losing and humiliation is not your fault. That there are these vast shadowy forces <coughs> that are totally screwing up your life and the world. And yeah, you've had a lot of failure and humiliation, but at least you see through the bullshit. And that's also characteristic of people in mental asylums, right? They all, not maybe all, but a great deal of them, are comforted and have a very strong sense that they see through the bullshit. And sometimes they're right, right? Sometimes dissidents are right. Sometimes marginalized people are right. Sometimes marginalized losers are right. Sometimes people who fail, right? You know, sometimes poor people are right. You know, sometimes people on the fringe are right and the elites are wrong. So I'm not passing any judgment here, but it is characteristic of the insane. I've noticed that they very strongly believe that, hey, I may be a little eccentric, but at least I see through the bullshit. What happens, I notice when people get more and more into conspiracy theories and dissident politics, they become increasingly assured of their righteousness that they see through the bullshit. And even though their life may not be working and they may be enduring failure and poverty and humiliation, they have developed a primary sense of self-worth is that they see through the bullshit, that they are able to look into the abyss. They're able to deal with the tough, harsh truths. And sometimes they're right, right? This is not like a judgment that, you know, I'm better than them because this is me. Like, I've experienced this. I've gotten into conspiracy theories and you know, dissident politics. And my experience is that the years, say 2013 to 2018, when I had a tremendous part of my self-worth was based on that I see through the bullshit. I currently don't believe in any conspiracy theories, of which I'm aware. But I really got into dissident politics 2013 to 2018 and it became a large part of my self-worth was that, well, at least I see through the bullshit. And guess what? My ability to see through the bullshit was greatly exaggerated. I didn't see nearly as clearly as I thought I did. I was not nearly as superior as I thought I was. I was not nearly as special as I thought I was. <coughs> I was not nearly as unique and wonderful and courageous and you know, a truth seeker and a truth teller as I thought I was, but I was deluded at a great overestimation of my own ability to see through the bullshit. So I'm sure there are some people in mental asylums and there are some poor people and there are some homeless people and there are some people in dissident politics and in marginalized social movements who do perhaps see more through the bullshit than the average person. But I do notice a great deal of smug self-assurance that, yeah, maybe everything about their life sucks. Yeah, that, that was what I was, uh, came to mind after my Andy Nowicki interview. So this is 
uh, July 15, 2021 side individually there aren't they aren't afflicted by the same things but other things hold them together you know uh you know being on the side of power uh tends to hold them together because you said they're all working together out there but there are so many fissures right i mean if we keep th talking about it how oh the contradictions are going to eventually bring them down and we keep talking about it come on with these long firm long form youtube conversations surely they're going to save Western civilization, right? Okay, what? Let's talk about what's maladaptive here. You have an, an in group identity. I don't really have one. I'm deracinated. I mean, I come to this late, and it's frankly political. And when you talk about, yeah, it's maladaptive if, if, if I live in LA. Where I live is, is pretty, uh, I mean, I can't, I have to deal with trans people all the time. You know, I have to be cool about it. You know, I can't. I mean, I could make a principled statement. Why wouldn't you be cool about things that you have no control over? Right? You have no control over the number of people who want to identify as trans. Like, why would you not want to have the best possible relations with everybody in your life, including someone you might be a neighbor who's trans or an expert in your field who's trans or someone who could give you a job who's trans or a coworker who's trans? I mean, I don't get the mindset that doesn't want to have the best possible relations with everyone in their life, but instead wants to take a principled stand by being just a total jerk. Stand, but I would never leave the house. So, <laughs> uh, but when I, when you're talking about racial diversity, yes, we're talking about also a fait accompli that, that they visited on the native white population of, you know, LA and everywhere else. Um, but, you know, I mean, and it doesn't necessarily an in-group identity. Yeah, I think, though, with those high IQ people who are good liberals, good people, uh, uh, they get together, but they're con they're confronted with things that, come on, that we know are outrageous, BLM, the trans movement. Okay, so all these things that, that uh, people on the right or on the left consider outrageous, there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, hey, Elliot Blatt is uh, is around, so let's uh, let's add Elliot Blatt to the stream. Elliot Blatt, blessings, bro. Blessings, can you hear me? I can, thank you. All right, wow, what a tension fraught week it's been, bro. Uh, how so, bro? I I had my own little uh, social media drama this week. Oh, what what happened? Well. I Remember our conversation last week? Um, I, I somehow made a, an off-handed comment about uh, Colin, and he became rather cross with me. Wasn't he joking? I mean, was it real? I, I get the sense that it was real because he made two separate tweets about it. I mean, I don't think he was hurt by the sense, but I think he was annoyed with me for sure. Oh, I, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm misinterpreting, but uh, my sense is that he was a bit annoyed. Yeah. I mean, he, oh, was very, okay. he was respectful and polite about it, but yeah. I mean, he accused me of straw manning him. Okay. Oh, them's fighting words. If, if <laughs> them's, them is insulting words. to an intellectual such as Elliot Blatt, it's being accused <laughs> of straw manning. You I must know. be incandescent with rage, bro. <laughs> I know, but like, I'm like, uh, you know, I don't even remember what I said exactly. I think it was, I said something about Russia Gate, right? And uh, I perceived that Colin was um, kind of believed the whole Russia hack the election thing. Now, I'm, I'm really hesitant to even talk about it.